What if there was a transit vehicle that was designed to go 200, 300, or even 400 miles per hour while riding on a cushion of air and designed to look like it was straight out of the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey? You would think it may be from Japan or maybe France or Germany. Well, it wasn't. It was a -a one-of-a-kind vehicle sponsored by the U.S. government and built by an American aerospace company. This is the story of the Roar Aero Train, granddaddy of American high-speed rail. Hi, this is Jeffrey. Now, if you go back to the 1970s, it actually was quite an innovative time for futuristic transportation initiatives. There was the -the state-of-the-art car program, also known as SOAC, which resulted in the testing of a very luxurious subway train in five U.S. cities. There was the Transbus program to design and build the transit bus of the future, but that did not turn out too well. And then there was the high-speed ground transportation initiative, which was to develop an entirely new type of high-speed ground transportation system that would link various cities. Now, there were three contractors who built vehicles for this initiative, and we're going to look at one of them, which was the Roar Aerotrain. So let's get started in finding out and learning about the story of the Roar Aerotrain, granddaddy of American high-speed rail. The 1960s. It was the height of the space age, and nearly every American corporation out there seemed to have an aerospace division which was working on new solutions to age-old problems, including that of high-speed land transportation. The U.S. government also wanted in on the action. While many ideas were drawn up and even constructed, one vehicle stood out among the rest. It was the Roar Aerotrain, granddaddy of American high-speed rail. Other countries were seriously looking at developing high-speed rail. Japan had built their successful Shinkansen bullet train. France was looking at developing their own high-speed rail network throughout the country. And Britain was developing a hover train to replace some of their Victorian-era railways. Since the U.S. believed it could take on and solve these same problems, the Urban Mass Transportation Administration, also known as UMTA, contracted the TRW Systems Group to conduct a survey of research being done in the U.S. on new land-based transportation technologies. In about 1965, TRW recommended going with high-speed tracked air cushion vehicles. Magnetic rail technology, which also was a contender, lacked the technology to be effective at the time. Jean Burton, a French inventor and engineer, developed his new form of transportation with rockets, but then switched to a linear induction motor in 1968, which would be whisper quiet. Umta was concerned about noise from a rocket-powered tracked air cushion vehicle. Royal then licensed the French technology for use in the U.S., and started to promote its aerotrain to potential buyers. Also in 1968, UMTA began requesting bids from various aerospace companies around the world to build a new generation of high-speed transit vehicles for the U.S. Then, in 1971, UMTA selected three aerospace companies for a new high-speed ground transportation system. They were, number one, the Gara Corporation, number two, Grumman Aerospace Corporation, and number three, Roar Industries Incorporated. UMTA was quite impressed with Roar's full-scale mock-up of its aerotrain. In 1972, Garrett had a detailed model of their vehicle on display, and Grumman's was still in the design phase. The Department of Transportation, also known as DOT, would build a test track in Pueblo, Colorado, where the new technology vehicles will be tested. In 1972, Roar began building their prototype of the aerotrain. It was built in Chula Vista, California. 
and was delivered by rail to Pueblo in 1974. The Aero Train was just one part of Rohr's transit plan for the U.S. It would be an addition to Rohr's other transportation businesses, conventional but modern subway cars, transbus, and the monocab. Rohr went on to build very modern but somewhat problematic transit fleets for San Francisco and Washington, D.C. Transbus was a failure, and then Rohr exited the bus business. The monocab suspended vehicles often stranded its passengers along the tight, elevated curves of its track. But Rohr really did think that the aerotrain was the future for its company and for America. Even a mini aerotrain was envisioned. Back in Pueblo, DOT received funding to build three test tracks for the prototype vehicles. The builders were in a rush to get the tracks completed. The Rohr team was only able to build one and a half miles of test track because Grumman wanted 22 miles for their prototype and used up nearly all of the available funding. When trials began, top speeds on Pueblo's 1.5 mile reaction rail test track reached about 145 miles per hour. The Rohr engineers wished they were given at least four miles of monorail track to get top speeds out of their vehicle. The side railing on the track provided the 2,000 kilowatts of electricity needed to power the air vehicle. Its dual 40-inch lift compressor fans generated 60 pounds of air thrust per second at 2.5 psi to lift the aerotrain off the ground. The black portion underneath was the skirt that held in the air which the aerotrain floated on. The aerotrain had no windshield. Instead, a camera was used to display the front view on the pilot's monitor. There was also an aft view camera placed behind a small hole in the back of the vehicle. Mice were a big problem out in the Pueblo desert, so nose plugs were used to keep them from crawling into the vehicle via the suspension air inlets and chewing up equipment when the aerotrain was idle. On the side of the aerotrain's car body, there is a pilot's door at the front and two single panel passenger doors that were probably just barely wide enough for ADA compliance. Further down at the other end is the closed service hatch which could be used to access an optional baggage compartment. Six large non-opening tinted windows completed the exterior design. The aerotrain was a single unit, but later plans would include a means of multiple unit operation to carry 120 passengers. Behind the pilot's door was the pilot's cab. A monitor was used to show the track ahead. The passenger doors popped out like plug doors and slided to the side. Very comfortable upholstered seating, normally not found on rapid transit vehicles, awaited commuters inside. Just inside the passenger door was the testing equipment used for measuring the aerotrain's speed, vibration, decibel levels, power levels, and usage. The Aerotrain's passenger interior had a very 2001 A Space Odyssey look to it. The back of the Aerotrain did not have a huge propeller and or giant rocket engines. War wanted a more sleek and stylish look. During an early test, the Aerotrain brought down power at the test facility track. More powerful transformers had to be installed along the track to get the Aerotrain the power it required. Under the back end of the aerotrain were the brake pads. The linear induction motor that propelled the vehicle could slow it down from 150 miles an hour to 20 miles an hour. But the aerotrain was not practical, and the end came quickly. It was determined that the United States would need to build numerous fission plants to provide power for any kind of aerotrain system. The money needed for an intercity aerotrain infrastructure simply was not there. So, was there a better solution for future urban transit using already existing infrastructure? To solve this problem, John Driscoll, a mechanical engineer on the project, came up with a unique idea of using wheels for the aerotrain to roll on instead of having it hover on air. Other engineers suggested the use of steel rails and steam. 
may be for use in a piston configuration, and a new design was soon born. Steel wheels, steel rails, and a steam-powered engine. Actually, it did trouble the engineers that a steam locomotive was more energy efficient than the aerotrain. And when this was mentioned to higher management in the Roar office that the aerotrain would cost more money to run than it would make in return, the engineers were simply told that they could look for employment elsewhere if they did not share the company's viewpoint. Roar's aerotrain later almost came crashing to an end when a visiting French engineer who was interested in the aerotrain nearly destroyed its linear induction motor while trying to start the vehicle. Something was performed out of order, which led to the reaction rail not cooling before burned out metal was propelled out the back of the aerotrain by the strong magnetic pull of its linear induction motor and frying a few components. The French engineer quickly fled the facility and was never seen again. That was the only time the French were ever involved with Rohr's aerotrain. In October of 1975, Rohr's test vehicle was sidelined and placed in mothballs in its Pueblo depot to keep it preserved for future use just in case. Unfortunately, it was never given the chance to reach its potential and to safely go above 145 miles per hour. And just to be safe, the aero train was elevated to make sure mice couldn't chew through the equipment. So then, what finally was the aero train's fate? Only one aero train was built. The test track contractor for DOT's Pueblo facility, TTCI, didn't want the vehicle. So the U.S. government simply gave the aero train to the city of Pueblo with one condition, that it would be put on public display in a positive light, such as at a museum. The Roar Aero Train was previously stationed on the outside on a small section of track at the Pueblo Weissbrod Aircraft Museum. Even after years of desert weather, the faded DOT test track colors of red and blue striping still show. The A decal on the front has been removed by someone as a souvenir. The Aero Trains 2 350 horsepower lift motors, the lift fans, the hydraulic propulsion system, the linear induction motor propulsion unit, the AC units, and the brake system are still intact, but not in the best of condition. The interior is also intact, but in a deteriorated state. In August of 2009, the Roar Aerotrain was moved after more than 35 years. Its new home is now at the end of West D Street in downtown Pueblo. Grumman's test train was also transported and has been parked next to it. And that's the story of the Aerotrain. The train of a future that never happened. So that's a brief history of the really fascinating Roar Aero Train. Now, even though America doesn't have a huge amount of high-speed rail, uh, we're told that in the coming years, we're going to have lots and lots of high-speed rail. And so the Roar Aero Train is really uh, one of the forerunners of American high-speed rail. Now, another thing I wanted to mention is that there's this really great site out there uh, on Google Sites about the Roar Aero Train. And uh, unfortunately, there is no name of an author of that site. So unfortunately, I cannot uh, credit the person who had put together that site. But there is so much more information that I can put into this video. So if you want to learn more about the Roar Aero Train, please visit this site. It is so fascinating. Uh, and there's just so much more information than I can ever put into one single video. So anyway... I hope you enjoyed this look at the Roar Aero Train, granddaddy of American high speed rail. And as always, thank you so much for watching and have a great day. Bye.